So to continue the discussion on how to size the powertrain for a hybrid and a plug-in hybrid electrical vehicle, we need to look into four different things yeah, when we design the vehicle. The first thing you're looking at is uh, how to overcome the acceleration. And the second one is uh, how to uh, overcome gravitational resistance. And third is how do you achieve certain uh, steady state velocity. The complete design, as we mentioned, is a very complex issue which involves uh, numerous uh, variables, constraints, considerations, and so on. If we look at the model of a vehicle, there are four different forces applied on the vehicle. The chart showing here, uh, showing a quarter vehicle model, uh, where you see uh, the weight of the vehicle is equivalent on um, one of the four wheels. There's a traction force that moves the vehicle. There's aerodynamic force that uh, is a resistance. There's a gravitational resistance. Then there's a rolling resistance. So let's take a look at details of each of the resistance. The gravitational resistance is the resistance uh, that um, the vehicle uh, it itself, when the vehicle is on a slope, part of the vehicle weight will become a resistance. Now, if you are on a down slope, the part of the vehicle weight is actually going to become a traction uh, to move the vehicle. So the gradient resistance is mg times sine alpha, where alpha is degree of the slope. However, it is a degree, it's not the percentage. Normally, the gradability is defined as percentage of a grid, a percentage of slope. So every, uh, say, uh, 100 meters of horizontal distance, how much uh, height you go up. So that's the percentage. That should be expressed as tangent alpha. But uh, in calculating the gravitational resistance is mg times sine alpha. The second resistance is a ruling resistance. Ruling resistance is uh, generated because the wheel of a vehicle is ruling against the road surface. It you could happen in two different scenarios. One scenario is when the vehicle is a hard road surface. In that case, because our tire are not rigid, therefore the tire will change shape. So if you look at the different, uh, the display uh, diagram, when the tire changes shape, the weight center of the vehicle and the rotation center of the vehicle are going to be different. Once they're different, there will be a force generated, which is not in the vertical or horizontal direction, but the projection of the horizontal direction becomes a resistance. So that is called a rolling resistance. Another scenario could happen when the vehicle is rolling on a soft road surface. In that case, your wheel may not change shape, but your uh, surface, road surface, might change. In that case, your wheel is spinning, is uh, rotating against a wall. That is the change shape of the road surface. That is also considered as a rolling resistance. To calculate a rolling resistance, usually there are two coefficients. One is called C0, other one is called C1. Um, so the ruling resistance is C1 plus C0 plus C1 times V2 squared. Uh, so that's C0 is a ruling coefficient, C1 is a ruling coefficient times V squared. So you can see that it is a function of speed, but C1 is generally small. So in this case, C1, C1 is small, so C0 is dominant. So mg times, times C0 becomes the ruling resistance. Now, of course, depending on the uh, direction of the vehicle, it could be negative, so you take um, sine alpha. On the other hand, if the vehicle is not spinning yet, so if the vehicle is not moving yet, at that moment, the ruling resistance is not going to be m0 times uh, mg times c0. It's going to be actually the difference between the traction force and uh, the uh, gravitational force. So that difference is equal to your ruling resistance. But beyond that point, when speed is not zero, uh, you, you can easily calculate the ruling resistance. I mentioned that two coefficients, C0 and C1. As I mentioned, C0 is dominant and C1 is quite small. For different vehicle, 
and tires, uh, C0 is different. So you can see on the table listed here, uh, listed a few different road conditions. For example, car tire on the concrete or uh, uh, ash hole, it's going to be 0 0.013. But then if you look at truck tires on the concrete, it's going to be 0 0.006. Um, so they're going to be very different depending on road surface and type of tire. A third force is aerodynamic resistance. Aerodynamic resistance is a force by wind or by air that acts on your front of the vehicle when the vehicle is, is in motion. So apparently this force is going to be a function of the frontal area, a function of air density, and so on. So how to calculate ruling resistance, there's a classical equation that says 0 0.5 times rho, which is air density, Cd is uh, aerodynamic coefficient, AF is the frontal area, and then V is vehicle speed plus VW, uh, the VW is wind speed. If wind is against your vehicle frontal, your aerodynamic resistance is going to be more, it otherwise it's going to be less. A typical aerodynamic drag coefficient uh, is uh, based on the type of frontal. So if you look at an uh, open convertible car, that's that would have a very large aerodynamic coefficient. And then if you look at streamline design vehicle, the aerodynamic coefficient would be much smaller. So uh, one thing that I want to mention is uh, if you look at the truck and the buses, they are always have a f very flat, very big frontal. So their uh, ruling uh, coefficient may be uh, same as uh, other vehicles, but their aerodynamic um, force could be very large. And some of the studies show that if we change the frontal area of a truck to a streamlined frontal, you can save roughly 5 to 10 percent fuel on those trucks. So that's something that vehicle designers has to uh, look at during their design phase. So the vehicle power demand will have to satisfy this uh, uh, three different resistive force. Be Besides that, we also have to satisfy acceleration. And in fact, acceleration is the most uh, needed force within all these forces. So if you look at this summation of vehicle power demand, it included um, gravitational force, uh, ruling resistance, aerodynamic resistance, and the acceleration. If you can calculate the force that is needed to drive the vehicle, and then you can easily calculate how much torque is needed on the wheel and how much power is needed on the wheel. Now this is the pure need or the net need of the power to drive the vehicle. Now if you look at the total actual powertrain power, then you would have, have to consider the efficiency of each component and the transmission and the vehicle itself and so on. To evaluate a vehicle performance, as we mentioned that, we need to look at a few things. In addition to overcome all this resistance, we have also to satisfy the acceleration requirement. Now, how do you evaluate the performance? Normally, what we do is we calculate the total force, uh, not including acceleration, but the three different forces, uh, ruling resistance, gravitational, and uh, aerodynamic resistance, we plot them as a function of speed right? and for each different grade. So on the diagram here, you show the more or less horizontal lines uh, shows the resistive force. Then on the same diagram, we're going to plot, we're going to plot the engine torque, which could be translated to wheel force. Because on the engine, we need the gears. And the reason you need gears is because the engine has only certain range of speed that can drive the vehicle, but it won't be able to satisfy the whole uh, range of vehicle speed. Therefore, you're going to need gears. So you can see here we have four gears in this example, first gear, second gear, third gear, and the fourth gear. And each gear, uh, based on the engine speed range, you can plot the torque as a speed corresponding to the vehicle speed. Now, on the diagram, once you have the two groups of curves plotted, you can easily find out what is the grade that the vehicle can climb. Take example, at 100 kilometers per hour, the cross, the cross of engine torque and the resistive force is between, is between 5 degree 
and a 10 degree. And you could run on fourth gear or third gear on, at this speed. But your gradability will be bigger at the third gear because you're going to run roughly 7.5 degrees. Otherwise, the degree is a little bit lower. However, when you do climb a five degree grade when you're on third gear, you can see the difference between engine torque and the resistive force of the vehicle is relatively small. What it means is that you will not have a lot of force available for acceleration. So similarly, if we look roughly around 25 kilometers per hour, you would have to run the vehicle at the first gear. And at that time, you can climb roughly 30 degree or 57% grade. But at the other grade ability, apparently, the acceleration force will be really small. But if you're running at a, say, lower grade, at, say, 5 degree, at 25 miles on the first gear, then your acceleration force will be very large. So this is a way to find out this is a way to find out how uh, the vehicle would accelerate and what kind of grade the vehicle can climb. This is for an engine. Now, if we look at an electrical motor-driven vehicle, in that case, the motor has a pretty wide speed range with a constant torque region and a constant power region. Now, let's look at the diagram showing the torque of the motor plotted on the same graph where the vehicle resistive force are plotted. And you can see that with a single gear, one gear reduction, may, may not be just a single gear, but it's a fixed gear speed reduction, the motor torque can satisfy a wide range of vehicle operation needs, all, all the way from zero to 160 kilometers per hour. Now that is your maximum speed. So on this diagram, you can see <coughs> the cross section, the cross point between motor torque and vehicle uh, resistive force at zero grade is the maximum speed of your vehicle. And then when you lower the vehicle speed, you can see that you can climb a little bit larger grade. On this example, at 100 kilometers per hour, again, you can climb roughly 7.5 degree grade uh, between uh, 10 to 15 percent. But then at that time, the force that you can, re you can use to um, drive or to accelerate the vehicle will be very minimal. Now again, if you go down to below 50 kilometers per hour, uh, the grid that you can climb is uh, roughly uh, between 20 degrees and 25 degrees. And in that area, you can have a constant acceleration because uh, uh, the difference between the motor torque and uh, resistive force are relatively constant. So given the needs of traction force, we can convert them, uh, we can convert it into a, a traction torque on the wheel and then the power. And then you can easily calculate it with these equations. The traction force is equal to the three resistive force plus acceleration, and then the torque is equal to force times uh, radii of the wheel, and the power is force times speed of the vehicle. So based on what vehicle speed you're looking at, and then you can easily plot for, uh, power as a function for speed. Now this power, depending on what type of uh, HEV or PHEV you're designing, uh, this power could be the summation of the two different propulsion systems, or it could be just electrical motor. Now if you are designing a REEV, this P equal to F times V is the power of the motor, because that motor has to satisfy all different um, types of driving conditions. But if you're designing a blended PHEV, this power is the summation of the motor power and the union power. Or it could be just a little uh, less than the total union power plus motor power, because in that case, you will have some uh, degree of uh, uh, margin in your power chain design. We mentioned earlier that the electrical motor uh, in the vehicle is relatively smaller uh, than the motor that we use in the machinery. The, one of the reasons is the speed of the motor in the vehicle is much smaller. Now, th of course, that is part of the requirement that we cannot put a huge uh, size motor in a vehicle. 
So to design an electrical machine, one of the important equation is the sizing equation. Uh, this uh, equation showing on this chart d squared l. d squared l is equal to a bunch of constants, and then times p is power divided by a b, and then divided by n. P is power of the electrical motor, N is the speed of the motor. So you can see that um, size of the motor is proportional to power, then inversely proportional to speed. Uh, D is uh, the diameter of the motor, the rotor of the motor, and L is the length uh, of the motor. So D square L stands for the uh, material, uh, the size, the volume of an electrical machine, <coughs> and power is proportional to that, and uh, speed is inversely proportional to that. So given the power of an electrical motor, you can reduce size of the electrical motor by designing a higher speed motor. Now, over here, I just want to explain a few things before we actually say, OK, how uh, high speed can you go? Now, normally, in order to reduce the size of the electrical motor, you would want to go to uh, a higher speed. However, there are a few limitations that we have to consider. One of the limitations is the thermal limitations, because we know that electrical machines generate heat, because the efficiency is less than 100%. That heat needs to be dissipated into air or radiated somewhere in the cooling space. If the size is too small, there's not enough thermal capacity, then you don't have enough uh, cooling mechanism to cool down the electrical machine. Give you an example, um, many of the electrical motors used for electrical vehicles, the size at 100 kilowatts would have an efficiency roughly 95 to 97%. So you're going to have 3 to 5 kilowatts of loss at its rated power. And that 5 to 3 to 5 kilowatts loss is a lot of heat to be dissipated. So therefore, you will have a limitation by heat. Second is the strength of your shaft. If your motor size is too small, your shaft may not be strong enough to transmit torque generated by the motor. So therefore, your shaft needs to be large enough in order to transfer torque. Now, that may not be a concern in electrical vehicle motor design. That may, not, may be a concern on extremely high electrical machines and large electrical motors, such as one that used for uh, flywheel energy storage and so on. A third limitation is that is the power electronics. Uh, of all these electrical motors used for vehicles, motors are controlled by power electronics. And those power electronics are switching at a certain frequency. And in order to produce a sine waveform, we need certain switching cycles during each period. So uh, we have a certain uh, minimum uh, switching, uh, minimum number of poles needed for a certain frequency. On the other hand, all the power devices that we have, whether it's MOSFET for low power application or IGBTs for high medium power applications, they all have limited switching frequency. In particular, IGBTs have a switching frequency limitation, uh, not more than 20 kilohertz. And when you go beyond uh, 50 kilowatts, the switching frequency usually drops below 10 kilohertz. So therefore, you have a limitation by the power electronics. And that switching has a certain speed as well, so you don't you want to limit the switching loss of the power electronics. Therefore, uh, you have uh, this limitation to limit the uh, motor uh, size in an electrical vehicle. However, on the other hand, the size of a motor is very different from the size of an uh, engine, and it's also different from the motor that we use in the machinery. The reason is this. In electrical vehicles or hybrid electrical vehicles, the electrical motor is not running continuously at rated power. We only rate, we only need high power when we do accelerations or when we do a hill climbing. So those gen in general may not last very long. While in the factory and the machinery, the motors are designed to run 7, uh, 24 7. So they're continuously Rated. So therefore, if we look at the example that I give here, if you design a 30 kilowatts motor as a rated power, what it means is that you can run this motor at 30 kilowatts continuously uh, with uh, adequate cooling um, in operation. 
But if I want to run this motor only for 30 seconds, I'm going to stop or I'm going to reduce at a very low power for a certain amount of time, usually a few minutes. And then I will run the motor again. You can actually double the power output of this electric motor. So similarly, if you run the motor for only 15 seconds, you can triple the power of the motor, which you can run to up to 90 kilowatts if you run only for 15 seconds. In some extreme conditions, for example, aerospace applications, the motors usually are designed very small because some of those operations just very uh, short duration. So therefore, on an electrical motor, the size is not, the size is re really related to how you operate the motor. This duration of operation and the overloading of the motor is basically determined by the heat capacity of the electrical motor. Uh, what it means that if you run for a short duration, you're going to generate more heat. But since the duration is so small, so the total heat flux uh, is limited, and then you give it some more time to uh, cool down and then you can use the motor again. The efficiency definition of an electrical motor is also different from that of an engine. Because electrical motors, even though they can be very efficient, but they can only convert electricity to mechanical or mechanical to electricity. They cannot convert original energy, original energy stored in the original source like a gasoline. So the comparison between the efficiency of electrical motor and the efficiency of a heat engine is not fair, per se. So one of the fair comparison to be made is to compare if we use the same kind of energy source to drive a vehicle, one using electrical motor, but the other one use a heat engine. This comparison is usually referred to as well to wheel. From where you dig, say, uh, one barrel of oil, one goes to a pass to refinery, generate electricity, put on battery, put on the car, uh, and then drive the car for a certain distance. See how many miles you can drive. And then the other one would be the same barrel of petroleum, goes to refinery, uh, refine, get gasoline, uh, transport to a gas station, put on the car, and see how long you can drive. Now, all both, uh, we, both parts would consider the losses during transmission of whether it's fuel or electricity. The comparison did show that their efficiency are pretty close. However, the electrical vehicle will get a few percentage of gain. So uh, overall, uh, the electrical motor operated car will still have a better efficiency. And also, based on what discussed earlier, this Electrical motor driven vehicle can also be charged from other sources such as solar and wind other than petroleum. So therefore you can advantage from other aspects. As I mentioned that within this electrical components, there are electrical motors, there are power electronics, and then there are batteries. So those are the things new to a hybrid and plug-in hybrid electrical vehicle. If we take a look at the power electronics uh, used for one of the hybrid systems. And this is, uh, in particular, this one is for the RX450H. And you can see on, in this diagram, it shows four power electronics units. On the left hand, there are three electrical motor inverters. So those are three, each one consisted, consists of six IGBTs and six diodes, the red, uh, the black, and the blue. So those three are in waters. Each of them are controlling one electrical machine in the Toyota uh, or in the RX, Lexus RX450 design. Two um, in the front axle, one in the rear axle. If you look a little towards the right, there's a DC-DC converter. This is a bi-directional DC-DC converter. That link battery on the very far right hand to the DC bus of the electrical motor, which is at 650 volts, and the battery is at 288 volts. So this DC-DC converter is bi-directional. It manages the charging and discharge of the battery, and it also tries to maintain the bus voltage at a constant. So you can see that there's a lot of power electronics 
involved in a hybrid electric vehicle. Other than the three, uh, the four power electronic units displays, displayed here, we also have some other low power power electronic circuit in a hybrid electric vehicle, which we, not, we did not draw here. For example, the air, compress, uh, air compressor pump uh, motors, the air conditioning motors, and the DC-DC converter linking the auxiliary battery and the hybrid battery. So those power electronics are also part of this whole um, power electronic system. And if you look at uh, with recent uh, development in, uh, in the world and in the United States, the U.S. Department of Energy, DOE, there is a division called uh, Vehicle Technologies. And within that, there's office called Freedom Car um, Program. And they support research in all three areas uh, to support electric vehicles, uh, motors, power electronics, and batteries. On this chart, we are showing uh, the two uh, areas. One is the electric motor, the other one is power electronics. What is the goal that the DOE wants and what is the current uh, condition and how uh, they're going to move forward to satisfy the requirement. For example, for the power electronics, uh, someone control, uh, the key challenge is cost and reliability. And so the research direction is to be design smaller, lower cost devices through more aggressive cooling technologies, predictive thermal stress and reliability modeling, and so on. So we're working on these uh, areas, and uh, uh, there have been a lot of progress made in the past uh, 15 years. Uh, and in fact, for electric vehicle applications in this, uh, we have had a huge progress since 1990. And I remember in 1995, uh, in 1995, we uh, we bought a five kilowatts uh, induction motor uh, uh, driver. That's an inverter, five kilowatts, and the size of that induction motor was huge. Uh, oh, sorry, the size of that inverter was very large. It's like this big and this high. Now today. The five kilowatts in water would range roughly just like uh, less than a pencil box. It's really small. So this has there have been uh, huge progresses uh, in this area, and uh, that is one of the reason we can make this uh, electric vehicles uh, to be more uh, practical. In the electric motor and the power electronics, apparently those two components need to match. The ratings need to match, the current and the voltage also needs to match. So how do we design, uh, select voltage for this system? You probably have seen systems like 300 volts, 288 volts, 600 volts, 650 volts, 500 volts, or some area you may see 800 volts. So why are these differences, and what is some of the role to select these voltages? Well. It turned out that there are three things that we need to consider when we select the system voltage. One is the battery voltage corresponding to energy and power requirement of the vehicle. For example, a lot of the HEVs, their voltage is based on the battery voltage. When they selected the nickel metal hydrogen battery, all the batteries are put in series. You either get 200 volts, 244 volts, 288 volts, or 300 some volts, 365 volts, and so on. All these voltages are the battery voltage. Now that voltage may be low, may be too low for the motor drive, and I see why. Because the second limitation is the power semiconductor devices. They have a rating limits. Typical IGBTs today we have have two different ratings. One is for 600 volts breakdown voltage, another one is for 600. Uh, 1200 volts, 1200 volts breakdown voltage. So those two voltage ratings will limit how you select the system voltage. By the way, the 1200 volts device can only work on maximum 800 volts DC bus voltage. So your DC bus voltage cannot exceed 800 volts, but most likely you're going to limit to 650 volts. Okay. And third limitation is the system efficiency. When you select a higher voltage for your system, because the current redu reduction in the system, so you're more likely to get a 
a little bit high efficiency. So therefore, that is why we tend to lead, use uh, a higher voltage than a lower voltage. So as we mentioned, that typical IGBT has two different ratings. The 1,200 volts rating is good for up to 700 volts applications. The 600 volts is good for up to 400 volts applications. And their typical current rating is roughly 200 each. So given these conditions, when your battery voltage is only 200 volts, which apparently is not optimal for the IGBTs. So what do you do? And that is why you have a DC-DC converter to raise the battery voltage to another level, say 650 volts. However, if your battery system voltage is already 400 volts, if you select the 600, 600 volt device, you're good. So you don't need the DC-DC converter. So it really depends how the system is designed and what kind of power and energy demand of the system, and then we can select the system voltage. But overall, the voltage is limited by the three factors that we discussed, uh, the power device limitations, uh, the efficiency design considerations, and the battery uh, energy and power requirement. To talk about batteries, there are three different terms in a battery that um, we need to look closely. There are some other things in a battery, but these are the three things we have to look from the system's perspective. One is energy, one is power, and one is capacity. In fact, capacity is uh, ampere hour. Uh, if you use ampere hour times voltage, you will get energy. So therefore, capacity and energy are roughly uh, similar things um, if we do know the voltage system already, however. So power of a battery is in kilowatts. The power of the battery needs to satisfy the motor demand. So in the REEV, if you have a motor that is rated at 125 kilowatts, you will have to design your battery to provide 125 kilowatts, actually a little bit more than that because efficiency considerations, more than 125 kilowatts a battery. So that's the power rating. Power rating evaluate how much power you can get at any given moment. So that's the rate of energy flow. The second term is energy. Energy is in kilowatt hour. So if you drain power at a certain rate, certain kilowatt, for how many hours you can, uh, you can drain power from that battery? So that's called a kilowatt hour. That is a criteria to evaluate how much distance you can drive the vehicle. The available energy in a battery is also different from the nominal energy. So somebody give you a battery saying, I have 10 kilowatt hour battery. You basically cannot use that 100% energy. The most likely you can only get 70 to 80% the most from that battery. So when you calculate your driving distance or your equivalent electrical driving distance of that PHEV, you cannot use 100% of the battery energy. You only can use about 70 to 80%. And also, you have to note that energy, available energy is different if we discharge at a different rate. One of the reasons, of course, is the internal resistance of the battery. When you discharge at a higher rate, there's more losses wasted inside the battery. Therefore, there's less available to drive the vehicle. Therefore, when you calculate the distance, it also based on what kind of vehicle speed and what kind of power demand that you have for the vehicle system. So these are the things that we need to consider. And let's get back to the diagram. To design a vehicle, there are other three concepts that we have to understand. One is a battery cell, another is battery module, and lastly is a battery pack. As a system level, you, what you're looking at is a pack. However, packs are usually composed of modules, battery modules. And the modules are, are uh, composed of cells. Battery cells, each cell is how they make the battery. It's like the D cell battery, uh, the, the battery that we use for everything, you know, electronics. So most of those are just one battery cell. In lithium ion battery system, lithium ion batteries, they have a number of different uh, battery cells available. Uh, so then the standard size is called 18650 and 26650. 18650 means that the diameter is 18, the length is 65 millimeters, the diameter is 18 millimeters. So that's a cylindrical type lithium-ion battery cell. 
If it's 26, 650, 650, 26, 650 means the diameter is 26 millimeters, the height is 65 millimeters. Of course, those sizes are relatively small or even too small to be used for electric vehicles because you're going to need thousands of cells. Those cells are usually rated at 1.35 ampere hour up to 2.6 ampere hours. So uh, battery manufacturers have developed a technology for what we call a prismatic cells or rectangular cells. Rectangular cells, their size can be much larger at 30 to 40 ampere hours and their size could be 6, 5, 6 or 7 millimeters thick and then 200 to 300 millimeters high height and width. So you get a prismatic or you get this uh, uh, rectangle cells. A module is composed of a number of cells in series or in parallel, or parallel in series, series combinations. For example, uh, uh, 24P, 4S24P means there's four in series, 24 in parallel to form a module. And usually you will have some electronics for the module to monitor the module voltage, the current, temperature, and health of that battery module. And then you put a module in series and parallel. Depends. Most likely you might put all of them in series to form a higher voltage. And then you would have a pack. In a pack, you have to consider cooling, monitoring, protection, and reliability and safety design for the vehicle. In particular, if you are going to develop a OEM type PHEV, it has to be EPS certified and uh, crash tested. And then the safety of those batteries are becoming more critical. We mentioned that between battery and the DC bus, there's usually a DC-DC converter. Then that converter is called energy management converter. And that con the purpose of the con converter has two. One is to convert battery voltage to a high voltage, which is most suitable for the power devices we use for the motor drives. And secondly, this DC-DC converter can maintain the DC bus voltage relatively constant. At the meantime, it can manage the battery charge and discharge so that you can extend the battery life. So the diagram shown here is a DC-DC converter, which consists of two switches, two diodes, one inductor, and the battery is on the right hand, and the motor equivalent circuit on the left side, which is equivalent to the DC bus. So that energy converter is bidirectional. It can either charge the battery or discharge the battery. The design or optimization of a PGV and its components is how you can achieve a battery efficiency. It included HUV and PHUV. The uh, because this because all these uh, different arrangements, different topology available for the design, and because the more available drive components, the motors uh, and the engine, you have more flexibility and more freedom to design the components for the vehicle. And it also involves how to control the vehicle and the components. So that is called power management. Once you have your vehicle control optimized, and that's not easy, by the way, you can use different kind of methods, for such as fuzzy logic, neural networks, and true learning control, uh, dynamic programming, uh, and so on, to uh, optimize the vehicle control. Based on that vehicle control, you can also optimize your design. Once you optimize your design, you need to consider all the components, the engine, motor, generator, battery, power electronics, and power management all together. So with all these conditions, you can do a system-wide optimization. Try to optimize the size of each component and try to optimize the control of each component. But again, because there are so many variables, so many inputs and outputs, usually the optimi optimization does not have, um, does not give you a unique solution. You may have a number of solutions that can satisfy um, that requirement. And some of the solutions may be um, better in some areas, but maybe worse in other areas, but some other solutions may be 
operate. So design is, is, is done in such a way that to achieve the best fuel economy. So those are the components, how to design, how to select, how to optimize the components for hybrid and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Take a look at the existing HEV. This picture showing the 2004 version of the Toyota Prius powertrain. This powertrain included the engine itself, the electrical motor on the left hand, the generator in the middle, the planar gear between motor and the generator, and the power electronics. So this is the powertrain, the tail down powertrain. And we can have see that brake down wheel of the powertrain included the planetary gears. Uh, the, uh, this is the, so the planetary gear system and the uh, speed reduction gears. This is the rotor of the generator. It is a permanent magnet rotor. So the, by the magnets are inside. The two ends, they have shields to hold the magnets inside, so you actually don't see magnets from outside the rotor. They are buried inside. This is the motor of uh, that powertrain. And the motor is also permanent magnet. It's on the permanent mag magnet is inside the rotor. Uh, the stator has windings. It's a three-phase uh, induction machine. Uh, I'm sorry, the three-phase PM machine. This is the power electronics used to control the generator and the electrical motor. The open wheel of the power electronics, that in included the uh, power electronics, uh, the capacitors and the inductors inside. So you can see that in fact with this power electronics, the power electronics themselves are not that huge, but the capacitor, the passive components are fairly large. And, and I also discussed this this is one of the reasons we're trying to work hard on power electronics devices to increase the switching frequency. Once the switching frequency is increased, we can reduce the size of passive components. Therefore, we can reduce the overall size of power electronics. We already saw this picture before. It shows the cooling system for uh, the previous powertrain. So the next topic I want to discuss energy storage options for HEV and PHEV. So in this section, we're going to look at lithium ion batteries, ultra capacitors, and their potential as an energy storage option, uh, integrated pack with lithium ion battery and ultra cap, and how to manage the uh, pack. Battery, up to now, is still the only solution for any storage for HEV. A battery is actually a very simple device. It is an electrochemical device that consists of uh, electrolyte, electrodes, and a separator. So batteries rely on chemical reaction. When it reacts, it will release, it will release electrons when you discharge, and it will absorb electrons during um, during charge. So therefore, you can store energy during charge and you can uh, release energy during discharge. The main components in a battery included a positive electrode, and negative electrode, and electrolyte. In addition to those three components, we also have a separator between positive and a negative electrode to prevent electrons flow from, positive, uh, from negative electrode to positive electrode uh, when the battery is not in use, and that is called a leakage current. Talk about batteries, there are actually two types of batteries. One is called the primary batteries, other one is called secondary batteries. Primary batteries is a battery um, will have energy when they make the battery, and they are not reversible, so once the battery energy is used, the battery life is ended. The secondary batteries are rechargeable, which means they can be uh, reused. The chemical reaction is reversible. Within uh, secondary batteries, there are number, a number of type of battery, including lead acid, nickel, cadmium, nickel metal hydride, lithium ion, lithium polymer, uh, sodium sulfur batteries, zinc air batteries. So there are all kinds of batteries, but 
the ones that are suitable for today's HU and PHU applications are the nickel metal hydride battery and the lithium ion batteries, with lithium ion battery as a potential replacement for nickel metal hydride battery. The reason is this lithium ion batteries and even nickel cadmium batteries have very low energy density or specific energy. When you have a very low specific energy, you need a large size. When you have very low uh, energy density, you need a lot of weight to have the same amount of energy available. If you look at nickel metal hydride, which is developed in the 1990s, it is much better than, uh, than lead acid battery. It's almost, it double, it more than double lead acid battery. The lithium ion battery also started in the 1990s have a much better energy density than any other battery, rechargeable batteries available today. Lithium ion batteries, they are very popular already today in consumer electronics. Almost all consumer electronics using lithium ion batteries today. However, there are a number of limitations when we move from uh, consumer electronics to uh, hybrid and electrical vehicles. I can list a few for you. In consumer electronics, the discharge rate is usually very small because when we charge the laptop, for example, we can use a few hours. And when we charge a cell phone, we can use cell phone for a few days. So the discharge rate is very small. You're not charging them every day. Secondly, the number of cells on a consumer electronics is very small, maybe two, maybe three cells, or maybe just nine cells the most. And third, is consumer electronics does not last very long. Cell phones, cell phones usually last about two years, or maximum maybe three years. And at the end of that, uh, use, uh, and li end of life of the electronics, the battery uh, it has, has no use, so therefore we're not too much concerned. But in a hybrid electric vehicle, we use the battery on a daily basis, and we charge them every day and we discharge them at a very high rate, very high rate, uh, a lot more than um, the one that we use for consumer electronics. And we discharge the battery normally in a matter of 30 minutes, 20 minutes. So the rate is very high. And we have a lot more cells in the vehicle system. If we use the cylindrical cells, the ones similar to consumer electronics, we're going to need a few thousands of them in the system. So uh, reliability and um, control of such a large system becomes an issue. And lastly, vehicles' life can be more than 10 years long. Therefore, the batteries need to have a life similar to the powertrain life, which is, again, 10 years, where it's different from consumer electronics. So moving forward from consumer electronics,